and now first speaker is dr chamira bandara who is a consultant ocular plastic surgeon at national eye hospital colombo and he'll be talking to us about how to uncover your deductive power at eye injuries dr chamira bandara or to you yeah okay right okay hi bon uh, first of all uh, let me thank the president and the organizing committee of slma for inviting me to do this presentation at slma foundation session 2020 uh, working in a casual room is always challenging uh, when it comes to eye injuries condition is uh, more challenging if you haven't worked in eye unit earlier so conditions like these are quite obvious anyone working in the uh, casual room can detect these things you don't need mbbs to detect this of course you need mbbs to treat them but uh, these conditions are quite obvious but the challenge comes when things are not obvious when uh, things are not seen at the first uh, sight so there you have to be a smart guy so uh, the proper clinician should be an, a detective uh, who has a very uh, uh, high deductive capability to detect uh, uh, unseen problems. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle uh, mentioned his uh, book in Sherlock Holmes. It is uh, uh, my business to know what other people don't know. Similarly, the clinician should know what other people can't see and know. Uh, time is very crucial at casualties. The delay in diagnosis, uh, these problems can uh, life-threatening and vision-threatening. Why? The eye signs could be a clue for a life-threatening uh, uh, injury. And the same time for so delay can lead to life-threatening problems. In the meantime, delay in detecting and treating eye problem, there will be a less chance that you get good visual recovery and other function recovery. So whatever the, the, uh, the detection has to be done quite fast. So in my presentation, uh, I'm going to uh, focus on uh, four common uh, presentations and their causes and how to uh, work out uh, uh, through the patient. And I must say that I'm not going to concentrate on uh, the quite obvious gross injuries, but uh, think about and discuss about uh, uh, unseen or uh, the conditions which can easily overlook. Uh, altered vision. I think uh, this is one of the, the common presentation at uh, common presentation related to eye. Uh, there uh, we need to find because we don't have full equip, equip uh, eye assessment at casual room. So uh, we need to find out whether this altered vision is correct. So we need to go through the patient's past ocular problem and find out whether pay, uh, the patient had previous, uh, the poor vision, previous eye problem. And the other thing is the, uh, the patient's usual glass may be broken at the time of injury. So detection of poor vision at eye casual may be challenging. So we have to rely more on the history. We have to ask whether there is a real deterioration of vision which has been from the normal vision, which has been uh, there before the injury. And I must say, I'm not going to uh, uh, discuss about obvious gross injuries. Right, coming to uh, uh, altered vision, the one scenario we must think is uh, undetected uh, vision problem, which really detected after injury. For example, if one, one has poor vision in one eye, with good vision in another eye, when the both eyes are open, they uh, they might not detect that poor vision in that eye. So uh, that during after injury, uh, uh, because of the pain or irritation, they try to close one eye, and uh, at that time, he, all of a sudden, he might realize uh, the the vision is poor in one side. So uh, we need to uh, get a good history and find out how he detected that and. We need to look for common other causes like uh, refractive cases can get uh, the good vision after a pinhole or with a refraction mm -hmm. and all the other cases, uh, other cases we have to do a thorough uh, the examination to find out other than uh, causes other than injury in these patients. 
and then uh, if you have a good uh, uh, scenario if you can check the vision visual acuity there can be two scenarios one one with good visual acuity complain of uh, impaired vision another one with reduced visual obvious impaired uh, visual acuity so when you have uh, uh, impaired vi uh, good visual acuity 66 or 69 but still the patient complain of poor vision okay you can't say your vision is okay uh, 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 by because there are conditions where you can have good vision but with eye injuries. So uh, coming to cornea, so you can have blunt injuries like this. Uh, so you can slightly change the cornea shape and guide, induce an astigmatism. So you might, person might complain of poor vision because of that. And if you do a refraction, an auto refraction, and sometimes corneal topography, you can detect that. And tiny corneal uh, partial thickness lacerations, which are away from visual axis, might uh, might miss easily unless you do a slit lamp examination with proper slit beam, where you can get optical uh, cross section of the cornea. And tiny foreign bodies close to visual axis may not be detected unless you do good examination with higher magnification. Similarly, small corneal epithelial defect will be overlooked unless you stain with fluorescein. Uh, uh, you might miss that if you don't do that. And the pupil defects also can be associated with some amount of visual impairment because uh, uh, meiosis or midriasis can uh, alter the light entry to the eye and uh, thus the, the clarity of the image. The Both meiosis and midriasis can be due to the iris injury and can also be due to uh, the nerve injuries like Horner syndrome, the meiosis and the third nerve palsy with the dilated or the midriasis. So the detection of these very important so that you need to look for the brain injury. And then bilateral uh, uh, meiosis can be due to pontine hemorrhage or uh, substance abuse like cocaine. Again, bilateral midriatic eye can be due to uh, abuse of heroin and opioids. Why I mentioned about this substance abuse because the substance may be the cause, may be the risk factor for the injury or the accident. And then uh, coming to the anterior chamber and the vitreous, slight bleeding with microscopic high femur and the anterior traumatic anterior uveitis where you get the white cell floating in the anterior chamber or uh, mild uh, vitreous hemorrhage, you have the red cell floating in the vitreous, might have a good vision, but uh, not clear as earlier. So you need a thorough examination to find these things. And the coming to the retina, you can get retinal edema, we call uh, uh, commercial your retina because of the tra brand trauma. So uh, that can impair the vision. And if the, vis the fovea is intact, uh, uh, the visual acuity can be normal. And coming to optic nerve, the optic nerve injury, we usually call traumatic optic uh, neuropathy, uh, uh, can again can have a normal vision, 6-6, but, uh, unless you do a, a pupil check for the RAPD and the color vision test and the visual field, you might miss that. Okay. Particularly if the central vision is normal, the visual acuity can be normal, but the peripheral in injury will be detected with the visual field which need treatment. And so when you have good vision, manage, uh, the analysis is challenging. On the other hand, vision act visual acuity is low, you can't miss the cause, you must find the cause. And come to the cornea again, these are the not obvious cases, you can have decimate rupture as in the, the top picture, the decimate is the basement membrane of the inner layer, endothelium of the cornea, then you can have the rupture and it, there can be a fluid leak and you can get edema and the impairment of vision. And you can have the endothelium that is the inner layer can get uh, traumatized and dysfunction. You can get corneal decompensation, either focal or diffuse. So you can get the corneal edema gain and uh, can impair the vision. So these things you need a th uh, uh, thorough uh, sit lamp examination to detect that. Uh, I, I want to mention about the sclera, just as sclera as well, because you can have anterior sclera rupture uh, uh, like this. But of course, if there's a subconjunctal hemorrhage, you will not see the, the rupture. Then, of course, if the patient is having soft eye, low intraocular pressure, and probably deviated pupil like this, then you need to think about possible sclera rupture, even you don't see the pigment under the conjunctiva. Coming to lenses, if there's a gross cataract like this, it's quite obvious, but the trauma can lead to posterior 
feather cataract where you get a very small cataract formation in the posterior lens which will be detected only with good dilatation and uh, acid lamp examination and the lens can be dislocated into the anterior chamber if it is clear it will not detect with the torch of course slit lamp examination is mandatory again lens can displace back into the vitreous and to the retina uh, so the iris plane will be empty but will not be seen with the torch but we need uh, the slit lamp examination to detect that and the fundal examination will show the the lens on the retina and again there can be, uh, depending on the history, you, if you suspect a foreign body, if there's a tiny entry which has self-sealed, uh, there can be foreign body in the lens, lenticular foreign body, and a need of uh, 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 kind of a good examination to detect that if you suspect from the history. Then the anterior chamber and the vitreous. If you look at the top pictures, uh, what is on your ha right hand side is the normal anterior chamber depth. But on the left side, you can see very abnormally deep anterior chamber. Uh, uh, this condition can be uh, associated with posterior scleral rupture. Having low intraocular pressure further add help for your clinical diagnosis. And then you can do a MRI can where you can see the, the probably you can see the site of injury with the deformed sclera. And the posterior segment foreign bodies. Again, uh, based on the history, if you are suspecting a foreign body, you need to do a very thorough uh, fundal examination after full dilatation. Uh, the history about the trajectory, the direction of the foreign body is useful where, uh, to, for you to decide the, uh, where you are going to look for. And the B scan, CT scan, X-rays might help full in detecting in difficult situations. And vitreous hemorrhage, if it's a gross thing, it's quite obvious. There's no difficulty in diagnosis. But I want to mention about this pre-retinal hemorrhage, where you get the bleeding between the vitreous and the retina in front of the fovea. The blood is really toxic to the uh, retinal cells. So if you don't treat this immediately, there will be permanent uh, retinal cell damage in front of the fovea, and there will be difficulty in recovering the vision. So if you detect this, you must immediately refer to a eye surgeon to get rid of this blood. And then coming to the retina, uh, the choroid. So if you've seen the fundus, this is the choroidal rupture. This is a large one, but if you, a small one like this, you need a good skill to detect during your fundal examination. The formal, foveal edema, the commercial retina or the retinal edema involved in the fovea can uh, uh, as I explained earlier, but they are, they are involved in the fovea, you can get poor, very poor vision. The macular hall, post-traumatic, there can be a, 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 a separation of macular tissues at the fovea level, and so we call macular hall. And uh, if it is small, even with the good retinal uh, exam examination, you might miss that. So if you need to, if you suspect that, of course, you have to ask for a OCT scan where you can clearly see the uh, the uh, inter, uh, this, uh, break of integrity in the foveal level. And then the retinal tears and detachment. The, the retinal tears can happen after a trauma. So when you have tear, from there onwards, retina can slowly get detached it's from partial to complete. So it's important to detect this early. If a patient complain of flashes or floaters after trauma, and if there's a segmental visual field defect, so uh, uh, need to suspect this and then uh, need, need thorough or the fundal examination uh, to detect this and treat earlier to avoid full detachment, which can be uh, uh, ch very challenging. Coming to optic, nerve, optic neuropathy, which I discussed partly earlier, can have the normal to a uh, non-perception life vision. The pupil will uh, have APD, that is apparent pupil defect or relative apparent pupil defect, color vision defect, visual fields. If it's the same, the, the, the significant damage, there will be central visual field impairment. However, the fundal examination can be normal in most cases, but sometimes you can have retinal edema and the disc edema. CT also may not be useful in most of the cases where you not see any significant uh, the changes, but really you can have bone fragment closer to the orbital apex. So why do you get uh, the, the traumatic optic neuropathy without a fracture? Because uh, during the, the blunt trauma, there can be a relative movement of the optic nerve 
in relation to the optic canal then the tiny pile vessels can get a uh, break and the, that part of the optic nerve go into ischemia and uh, 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 vision can be uh, uh, deteriorated so that's about the altered vision so uh, moving to the next topic that is the double vision seen two images of the same ob object in a field of vision so why do you get a single vision but with the both eyes how do you get that is because when you get the one image the uh, the uh, the image uh, the one object image form in the the current corresponding retinal points which are wired to the same locus in the occipital brain and then uh, it will be seen as a single but when there's a misalignment the object will not be uh, image will not be formed in the same corresponding points and so the in the brain and there will be a double vision but there's a special scenario for same corresponding retinal points you can get image of two different objects which lead to overlapping of uh, images and so brain will get a bit of confused so they will not be able to identify what the, the object is so when you come into analysis of uh, the diplopia the first thing is you need to find out whether it's a monocular diplopia or binocular diplopia binocular diplopia so in the when the both eyes are open there will be double vision but when one eye is closed there will be no double vision and that is usually due to a problem with the alignment of two eyes and the monocular diplopia even you close the one eye the diplopia will persist and this is usually due to the core origin and from the optical problem in the one in a one eye so come to the monocular vision the things can get confused again is a blurred vision so mild to moderate blurred vision some people perceive as double vision so it's important that you need to us specifically if this is a blurred vision or it's a double vision and if it's a blurred vision it can get cleared with a uh, uh, pinhole or correction with that and coming to the cornea the same kind of blunt trauma to the cornea can change and the shape and get multiple uh, uh, refractive powers at different uh, uh, segments in the cornea so you can get multiple uh, image form in the back of the retina leading to the uh, um, uh, double vision so if you do a pinhole test uh, that will block some of the segment and might get the uh, the diplopia get cleared on the other hand doing a auto refraction corneal topography which will confirm the the abnormal shape, shape of the cornea as usual this corneal shapes uh, is a transient thing but uh, uh, rarely it can persist for a longer period the iris iris of course with the injury you might get a, a, a additional defects in the iris or you can get the iris get uh, detached from its attachment to the ciliary body in one point or from the multiple places so when you have this kind of multiple uh, 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 holes like we call secondary uh, pupils as you get each pupil act as one uh, one visual segment so you might get multiple image form on back of the retina leading to monocular uh, diplopia and then the lens subluct lens so if you get the lens sometimes after cataract you might get a segmental cataract like this in the top picture and the, so there will be two different segments in the lens with different optic powers refractive powers and you get two images form and double vision and the lens or the implanted lens can get subluxated so across the pupil so there are two segments one is with the lens and one is without lens so you obviously you get Uh, two image from the retina called into same monocular double vision and the retinal detachment again when there's partial retinal detachment the one segment the image form in the one segment will be different from the other segment so the one, this one will be blurred and it's more anterior and this will be more sharp it's more posterior so the brain will perceive it as a uh, double vision and cerebral polyopia this interesting thing but uh, it's very rare a trauma to the brain can cause a uh, 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 polyopia which is episodic and you might see two or more images and it doesn't okay at the time of fixation take about milliseconds to seconds to you get the double vision and it lasts for seconds and hours and then it drift or fade or disappear gradually and the double vision is at the one side or both side of the uh, the focus of object and it the direction of double vision can be either vertical or uh, uh, horizontal or diagonal and the images can be of different size and the double vision can occur both for the near and the distance things 
and the motion of object either disappear this double vision or drift to another object where you get again polyopia. So this is basically diagnosed with the history. So you had to be, you had to know this for us to us ask from the patient. And uh, the binocular double vision is due to the misalignment with uh, to a visual axis, which can be due to either displacement of the globe or uh, impairment of the eye movements. So the globe displacement can be due to any space occupying lesion like hematoma displacing the globe or the bone fragment displacing the globe, air inside the orbit displacing the globe or foreign body inside the orbit displacing the globe. So these conditions can cause globe dystropia and uh, need uh, scans usually to uh, detect these things. And the next thing is possible is the prolapse of uh, globe into sinuses. For example, if you have a large orbital flow uh, uh, fracture with defects or medial wall fracture, globe can uh, 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 prolapse uh, either mild or severe to the globe, uh, uh, to the sinus and will get a uh, 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 binocular double vision. And the ocular motor defects uh, can be due to muscle injury then usually only one muscle involved, so you get the dysfunction of the one uh, muscle action. And the muscle damage can be at the ten tendon level, so where you get the tendon attachment, if you see a laceration, a scleral or conjunct laceration, you need to suspect and look for the tendon to find out this uh, uh, injury, if there's eye movement defect. And then uh, the muscle belly can get damaged by penetrating injury. So if there's a penetrating injury with the eye movement impairment, so you need to do MRI scan to find out the muscle disruption. And the mechanical problem. For example, if you have flow fracture with the muscle and the soft tissue prolapse, this muscle will not get relaxed when uh, the looking up uh, the opposite direction. For example, when looking up, this side doesn't rotate upwards when, because there is a flow fracture with uh, tissue entrapment. And if you do a forced action test where you catch the eyeball and uh, move manually and you will feel the resistance for opposite direction. And then uh, the foreign bodies in, in relation to the muscle can uh, uh, impair the, the movement even with a small injury like this. If the, the history is suggestive of possible uh, yeah, for, foreign body inside the orbit, we have to go for a scan when there's an eye movement defect. And the paralytic things are quite obvious. We know about third, fourth, and sixth nerve poles can lead to a uh, double vision. So if the typical picture is there in your examination, you can die. And you should not forget about the internucleophthalmopedia, uh, uh, where which can be detected clearly on the examination findings. I just want to mention a few things. One is superior orbital fissure syndrome, where the, all the optic, all three nerves leave the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. Any fracture at that point can damage all three nerves, so the eye, eye will be frozen, or there will be total external ophthalmophilia. When it comes to the skull base, the nerves can again slightly deviate, but you might have two or three nerve involvement with the skull base fractures associated with uh, uh, fifth nerve, my mandible, maxillary nerve. Uh, uh, sensory loss will uh, uh, you make you to suspect about the skull base fractures and then you have to ask for a scan. And if uh, uh, the oculometer defect is associated with long tract signs, of course, you have to think about the brainstem injury uh, where you have to go for a, a brain scan. Coming to the next topic, the proptosis, it's not uncommon, but can be mild to more severe uh, in uh, uh, pro, uh, severity. And one condition I want to mention is orbital compartment syndrome. When there's a sudden expansion of the tissue pressure in the orbit, so you might get mild proptosis with tight lid, uh, tight lids uh, where you can't uh, move the lid apart and there'll be a lot of uh, redness, chemosis and the high intraocular pressure. So you have to think about orbital compartment syndrome because the detection of this is very important because uh, if you delay the treatment, uh, there will be optic, permanent optic nerve damage. So you need to do a canthotomy and cantholysis to release the pressure. So detection is very important to timely management. Proptosis, again, there can be pseudoproptosis. For example, if with the brain damage, you might get lead retraction with the scleral show and you will think it is a proptosis. 
but it's of course a brain damage so if you look from the top or if you with the exophthalmometer you will find that both eyes are at the same level but no proptosis and of course lid rim fracture with posterior dislocation of the orbital rim and it will expose the sclera more and you will get a false impression of uh, proptosis and the opposite eye enophthalmosis due to either orbital flow fracture or any other problem so you might get the good you might think it's a good eye is proptosis so uh, you need to find that and the true uh, uh, proptosis can be due to a space occupied lesion or, or due to a congestion vascular congestion so what are the uh, space occupied lesion which can happen uh, one is the bleeding either supra subperiosteal bleeding or retro orbital bleeding or inferior orbital bleeding which can uh, push the globe forward and the air and particularly when with fractures involved in the medial wall and the flow uh, the air can uh, air can enter into the orbit from the sinuses particularly after an episode of sneezing or nose blowing or straining all of a sudden air can leak into the orbit and suddenly you can get proptosis and sometimes with vision impairment so it's very important to ask the patient not to blow the nose if there's a, 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 a if suggestive of fractures in the uh, orbital floor and the CSF and the brain, CSF can leak into the orbit through a roof defect with uh, dural uh, tear. Uh, in addition to proptosis, you might feel the CSF under the skin uh, like fluidic. And if you do the scan, uh, you might, uh, you can find the, uh, uh, the dural uh, damage and the CSF leak into this. And the brain can again prolapse into the orbit through the roof defect with the fracture and uh, with proptosis. And one clue for this is uh, having pulsation over the eye. When you feel uh, the flash, you might get the brain pulsation without uh, 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 much thrill or brewing. And the scans will help you to detect that. And then the bone, bone can displace into the, with fractures, bone can displace into the orbit. And then it can give additional volume to the orbit and push in the globe forward, or otherwise it, bone itself can push the globe forward uh, causing proptosis. So CT will definitely diagnose that. And the foreign body, if the history is suggestive of possible foreign body with proptosis, yeah, you must do a imaging to find whether there's a retroorbital foreign body, and uh, which can associate with slight bleeding and tissue edema and inflammation, which will add to the proptosis. And even if there's no lead injuries, this entry of the foreign body can be elsewhere, even temple, other side, nose, cheek, forehead. Still, you have to think about possible retrobalbar foreign bodies. Congestion are the most important thing for the proptosis of trauma. One is keratokinous fistula. With the head injury, you might get a, a fistula formation with the internal carotid artery and the cavernous sinus. So the arterial blood going into the cavernous sinus and the superior and the inferior ophthalmic veins, which lead to slight proptosis with congestion. And you will see radially di uh, directing uh, scleral uh, uh, dilated blood vessels, we call proctru vessels. And the patient might also complain a little bit of uh, like a hearing uh, 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 sound inside the brain or behind the eye and <clears throat> might get a, a, a pulsation of vision. And if you feel you might get the, the pulsation and uh, thrill and if you hear, you might hear brewing with that. So detection is very important. This you can confirm with the MRI, uh, can detect whether there's any features of that and confirm with the DSA. And it's important to detect this because you don't need to refer this patient to an eye surgeon, but refer to the neurosurgeon because they, there are instances we get patients with uh, keratokinous vestibule referring to the eye surgeon, but it should go to the neurosurgeon. And orbital cellulitis, uh, injuries with uh, contaminated objects uh, can introduce virulent infection. Even within one to two days, you might develop uh, uh, orbital cellulitis uh, in this patient. So uh, if you get a worsening proptosis, redness and pain, deviated eye or reduced eye movement, and uh, you, if you suspect a penetrating injury, then better do a scan and the, the features will help you to identify the orbital cellulitis. And the cavernous sinus thrombosis can happen with the base of the skull fractures as well as with uh, uh, infection in the lid and the orbit. 
and uh, uh, with that you might get a little bit of myeloproptosis and congestion of the con uh, in the conjunctive as well as the retinal vein congestion patient might complain of headache and bit of vomiting nausea and uh, based on the clinical features you might get a little bit of dyskidemia and if you based on the clinical features if you suspect that you have to do this and it's very important this is maybe life threatening if you to for you to detect this and then you can refer to the uh, neurologist for the for the management uh, coming to the last topic post traumatic ptosis it is common and uh, first again there will be pseudo uh, uh, ptosis where uh, things can mimic ptosis one is the opposite tie lead retraction which can happen with the brain injury so you will see the normal eye is totally and on the other hand uh, the the affected eye may be having anophthalmosis so the eye is gone back so the lid is coming down you think is ptosis but it's really anophthalmosis and here if you see the eye is rotated slightly upward so we call hypertropia when you hypertropia more of the the cornea is get covered by the lid and you think it is ptosis but it's basically hypertropia which can assess with nerve injuries these two pictures are interesting see so there will be ptosis but when you cover one eye the lid get nicely open up so why do you get this so you can get the ptosis as a, a kind of a, a, as a compensation for double vision so when you have double vision uh, involuntary people try to keep one eye closed and when you cover the uh, one eye so the lid get nice opposite eye the lid get nicely open up because there's no double vision so remember that the diplopia can lead to pseudo ptosis and the uh, uh, true ptosis can be due to mechanical aponeurotic myogenic or neurogenic so mechanical ptosis can be due to a blood which fill in the lid or tissue fluid filling uh, accumulating in the lid lead into uh, uh, ptosis and additionally born with the frac uh, fracture frac uh, fracture in the orbital rim the fracture fragment can uh, displace into the lid lead into mechanical ptosis aponeurotic ptosis aponeurosis is the tendon of the levator muscle which lift the uh, lid can get detached usually it's attached to the skin and the tarsal pit can get detached and go backward and then of course you will see some salient feet one is this high lid crease compared to the other side lid crease will be high and there will be ptosis and but if you check the levator function will be good and the patient might complain condition get slightly worsen toward the end of the day and there will be brow over action so clinical diagnosis or aponeurosis is quite possible which can be corrected with surgery and the myogenic the muscle belly of the levator muscle can get damaged by penetrating injury like this or sometimes even a small injury can lead penetrating injury through a small wound can lead to levator muscle damage and the ptosis another thing is the fracture in the roof with fracture fragment uh, damage in the levator can also lead to uh, ptosis the neurogenic uh, ptosis we know the, the levator is supplied by the third nerve if the third nerve get, uh, get damaged at orbit or skull base on brain stem can lead to uh, uh, neurogenic ptosis so if it's in the orbit the uh, the eye movement may be normal or only the superior rectus is impaired the rest of the eye uh, movements may be normal then of course you have to think about possible orbital uh, uh, injury in the orbit and the skull base of course you will have the full uh, third nerve involvement uh, along with uh, sometimes other uh, uh, ocular motor nerve involvement as well uh, that is uh, sixth and fourth nerve involvement uh, plus uh, as i mentioned earlier uh, uh, sensor impairment will help you to diagnose skull base fractures and the brain stem uh, discussed earlier you can get long track signs uh, uh, with full uh, third nerve palsy so with that uh, i like to conclude my presentation but before that i must share uh, a few two other sayings by uh, by uh, uh, sir arthur conal doyle in his book in sherlock holmes there's nothing more deceptive than an obvious fact never trust two general impressions but concentrate yourself upon details i think it's quite right relevant for a clinician who works in the uh, casual room so improve your detective power deductive power so that you can show your colors at the casual room thank you very much